button when we came on. So let me do this again. All right. I think that's all I need to say about continuity. All right. Okay. Let's get back to our differentiation rules. Yes, sir. If I remember correctly, we ended last session with um, the power rule. Yes, sir, we did. Okay. And then I told you the trig functions of all six trig functions. Yes, sir. Let's talk about that for a second. Wait, the derivatives of the trig function? Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I may not be drawing this accurately, but this is y equals sine x. This is y equal cosine x. And what I showed you last week was is that if y equals sine x, y prime equals cosine x. That's right. And that's talking about the derivatives? Yeah, exactly. It's talking about the slope of the tangent line. What is the slope of the tangent line at x equals zero in the top graph? That is, wait, that is undef, that's undefined? What is the slope of that? Hold on. Draw a it, It's one. Ah, notice that's what that is. Oh. What's the slope at pi over 2? That is... That is... The slope of that oh, horizontal oh, line. Zero. Zero. That's what that is. Hmm. What is the slope of this sine x at 3 pi over 2? At 3 pi over 2, that is 0 again. Uh-huh. That is. So you can see why the derivative of sine x is equal to cosine x. Yes, sir. It's the, it's the slope, it's the uh, continuous representation of the slope of the tangent line. Yes, sir. And that is actually true for all six trig functions I gave you. Where, That's right. in other words, the derivative of tan is what? Cotan. No, that's the way. Oh, that is the reciprocal and the cofunction of tan, but it's not. That the is, it is the secant. Secant squared. Secant squared. Yeah. And cotan. Well, let's cotan see. is negative cosecant squared. Yeah, there you go. Okay, let's review it as long as we're talking about it. I'm not sure that you have to memorize these immediately, but it doesn't hurt. Okay, so I'm going to give you the function. You give me what the derivative is. Yes, sir. Hold on. That is the that is the seek seek x tan, seek an x tan x. Good. So you know your first three. The first three being sine, tangent, and secant. Yes, sir. Because that's those are different from each other. In other words, that's the three different derivatives. 
So what's the derivative of this? The negative sine x. Yeah. And what is the derivative of that? That is the negative cosecant cotangent x. Okay, cool. You got to memorize, which is going to be very helpful. <laughs> okay, there's a few other functions that we need to memorize what their derivatives are. At least there's one. I talked about this last week. What's f prime of x? That is y f of x and z of x. F prime. Oh, for e, it's the same thing. Exactly. And that what, that's what makes this function unique. It's really right. the only function whose derivative is the same thing as the function. That's right. Now, there's one other that you have to memorize. Now, well, there's a lot more. <laughs> Uh, uh, differential calculus is a ton of memorization. I should straight up tell you that. Um, uh, excuse me. That is 1 over x. So the if the function of x is the natural log of x, the derivative, the first derivative of that is 1 over x? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's the natural log function. And if you wanted to know the slope at any point in time, say you wanted to know the slope right there, then it's that. Okay. Okay. If you want to know the slope up here, it's also that. Hmm. In other words, this might be uh, 2 and this might be 10. So the slope, yeah, it's not obvious by the way I've drawn it, but the slope at x equal 2 would be 1 half. The slope at x equal 10 would be 1 tenth. Yes, sir. This being y equal natural log of x. So even though some of these common elementary functions have other common elementary functions as their derivative, which is, there's a beauty in that, um, but the best thing you can do is just memorize. Yes, sir. It helps to understand also, but what I found with differential calculus is if you just really focus your energy on memorizing, eventually the understanding comes. It really does. Um, and, and it might be wrong to do them out of sequence. Uh, I would definitely say memorize first, even if you don't understand, you will at some point. Yes, sir. Now, there are six inverse trig functions. Okay. I'm going to give you this one. I'm not going to get into this heavily. When you take a derivative of an inverse trig function, you do not get a trig function. You get a polynomial. Hmm. All right. Okay. When you take derivatives of trig functions, you get trig functions, always. Okay. But not of inverse trig functions. And you can kind of see why. If I were to draw a triangle and label that one and that, um, no, I screwed up. That, you can see that all your sides are going to be x. That's right. And so the inverse trig function is going to be a polynomial. 
it's not going to be a trig function. Yes, sir. This is one that you should memorize. Um, unfortunately, you have to memorize all six, but they're not that significant. So I'm not going to say go ahead and spend the focus and time to memorize these. These come up rather seldom. And, you know, there's two ways to look at this. There's memorize everything you see, or there's memorize the super important ones and everything else you can look up in a table. Yes. If, if you got that book, Calculus of a Single Variable, you open it to the inside cover and it's got all of these. On wow. The inside cover. It's got all the derivatives, all the integrals, which is right. super valuable. So if you had something like that, that you could instantly look it up, then you wouldn't need to memorize it. I definitely advise that you memorize the derivatives of trig functions. Yes, sir. Because so much of calculus, differential calculus, involves trig functions that if you have them at your, you know, your uh, fingertips, it's much easier than having to look them up. Yes, sir. All right. So the power rule, hmm. it's y prime if y is equal to x times the square root of x. Okay, so the power rule. Notice there's four rules. There's the power rule. There's the product rule when you have two functions that are multiplying one another. There is the quotient rule when you have two different functions that are dividing one another. And there's the chain rule when you have a composite function. Okay. So, first of all, this looks like it might be the product rule. But is it really? What can I do here? That's equal to x times x to the 1 half. What's that's that? right. So that's x to the 3 halves. Apply the product rule. Ah, so the, apply the power rule. That's 3 over 2x times x to the 1 half. Well, the that, square root of x. Yeah, it's just that. In other words, it's 3 over 2 times x to the 1 half. Okay. That's right. So that's 3 like that. Okay. So in other hmm. words, we could use the power rule on this. Right? Yes, sir. What if we had the following? Now you can't actually multiply x times the square root of x plus 1. They're different things. Okay. One's x, one's x plus 1. Okay. That's right. There's no way I can multiply these two together. So this is perfect for the power rule. Okay. Now, the way to remember... The power rule or something else? The product rule. All right. Product rule. Okay. Sorry. This is the beginning of the product rule where the first function is u, second function is v. Okay. In fact, you know, let's change this. This isn't really the best example because I don't want to talk about the chain rule yet. Uh, let's talk about this. All right. Oops. <laughs> Freudian slip. Um, so, if you have the function, is the product 
of two different kinds of functions. Okay. Let's ignore the fact that I can simplify that. All right. Just this is a good example to use. Well, if you want the derivative of that, it's the first term times the derivative of the second term plus the reverse. Okay. And you have to memorize this. All right. So when you and this is the product. You multiply it together. That's what you do. So what is y prime here? Y prime is going to, and we're using sine x, secant x? Yeah. All right, so that's going to be, so the sine of x times, that is the first derivative of the secant of x, which is secant of x, tan of x, plus the cosine of x, times the secant of x. That is your final term. Okay. Now, this was not a particularly good example to use because I actually could have reduced that if I make the secant of x 1 over the cosine. Well, that okay. whole thing is tan of x. So y prime is secant squared of x. And mm -hmm. if you simplify that answer we got, you will find it's secant squared of x. Yes, sir. OK, without going through the math, I assure you that that's what it is. And that's why yes, this sir. was not a great example, is because I could have um, it could have simplified it. Let me give you another one where you can't simplify it. Oops, hold on. In other words, I have two different kinds of functions. I have a polynomial times a trig function. Yes, sir. Okay. So this so, is a better example because I can't simplify it first. Two to the two times x. No. Multiply oh. that times that. Oh, that's right. So six x. times sine of x. Oh, oh yes, sorry, my fault. And then, do you mean to have the... Uh, um, no, I don't. Uh, no. I apologize, okay. And then 3x squared times cosine of x. That's the product for a nutshell. Okay. Pretty simple. And notice that you can switch those two because of the yes. being added. Whenever you add A plus B, it's the same as B plus A. That's However, right. However, I have found with most students that you're better off not switching it. Always begin it like that. Okay. Because what ends up happening is because you can switch it around, a student spends 30 seconds figuring out what he can take the derivative of. <laughs> mm. That's not the way to do it. You don't want to spend any time at all. Just go ahead and take the derivative of that first thing, multiply it by the second, and then add the reverse. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, that's probably enough said with the product rule. Let's talk about the quotient rule. Yes, sir.
this case, you have u divided by v. Now, what this happens to be is, this is a complicated rule. All right. And there's one way I've found that makes it really simple. You start with the bottom and you end with the bottom squared. Hmm. Okay, what that means is I start with V times U prime. This time okay. subtraction is what's going on. I'm going to go do the reverse. Divided by the bottom square. Okay. So this new this whole thing is, is pretty complicated to remember, but notice that if you use the rule, you start with the bottom and end with the bottom squared, you can't get it wrong. Hmm. Yes, sir. I'm starting with the bottom. That's right. Well, the term next to it must be the derivative of the top, right? That's right. And since order matters, this must be subtraction, because if it was addition, I could do it the other way around. Yes. Well, that has to be the reverse of the first part. So if you use the rule, you start with the bottom and end with the bottom squared, you really can't get it wrong. That's right. Okay. Okay. Let's have some examples here. Here, let me do it this way. Uh, Hmm. It's actually a pretty cool one to use. Because remember, we memorized what that is. What is that? What's the derivative? Uh, well, hold on a second. Let me, I'm not so sure. Myself, I'm not so sure about myself now. Uh, let's go ahead and do it using the quotient rule. Let's see what we get. Okay. So we have Okay, so that's x times the cosine of x minus, is that just, um, hold on. The derivative is, of x. The derivative of x is? One. One. Whatever okay. the coefficient is. If it's the derivative of 2x is 2. The derivative of 7x is 7. So in this case, the derivative is 1. Oh, uh, okay. Times sine x. That's what u is. That's right. All over y x squared. By x squared, exactly. So this ends up being x cosine x minus sine x all over x squared. Now, hmm, now we can't really apply the uh, rule for the limit of this. Really is not the definition of first derivative. The definition of first derivative is f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, the limit of that is h goes to zero. So this is the answer right here. And I don't really see where I can simplify it at all. Usually when you have the quotient rule, you will be able to simplify it. Uh, let me give you an example. Let me think for a second. What's the rule? So that is... What's the rule for... Okay. Uh, v times... 
the U prime. Start with what? Start with start, start with the bottom, end with the bottom squared, and order does matter. matter. So start with the bottom. So that is the natural log of x okay. times six x minus the so the natural log of x is one over x times three x squared all over the natural log of x squared which can be written like that or i can write it like this But notice it's a lot like trig functions. You, if I didn't put the parentheses in the upper right, that would be something different. Yes. In other words, the natural log of x squared is not the same thing as the natural log of x quantity squared. Much like sine of x is not the same thing, or sine squared of x is not the same thing as sine of x squared. Yes, sir. Okay. So that's kind of your answer, but notice you can do a lot, you can do some simplification right there. So really the best answer, I'm gonna put this six X in front just because it's more uh, clear that way. You see what I did? Yes, sir. In other words, when I when I write it like that, it's always a little confusing if that's the argument or I'm multiplying natural log of x times six x. So the standard way of writing this is to put the polynomial in front of the natural log of x. I still want to use my quotient rule. I'm not violating that, but I'm just switching it around for clarification. Yes, sir. Notice I was able to simplify that to just three x. Hmm. And I can't, I could do one other thing. And sometimes it's very useful to do this. And that is I could factor out a three x. Hmm. Oh, yes, I see. Now it's not particularly helpful here. But there are times where it will be very helpful because you'll be able to cancel out another x between the numerator and the denominator. So the quotient rule is probably the hardest rule to memorize, but it's also the hardest algebra. You can have functions where the quotient rule Oh my God, the algebra becomes super difficult. You have to factor out anything you can from the numerator and then you have to cancel it with the denominator. Uh, I bother to find examples of that, but I could. And um, so the key with the quotient rule really is not memorizing the rule. It's being really good at algebra so that you can simplify the answer. Mm, okay. And it is a lot more, it's algebra three for sure, for sure. most of these things that you can, that can be simplified. Um, so, and you always want to simplify it all the way down. Yes, sir. Now you might be looking at multiple choice tests where this is not given as the answer. So unless you simplify it all the way down to that, that's what you're going to see on the multiple choice problem. Yes, sir. All right, Let's, let me give you one other practice problem here. Uh, let me think for a second. No, nah, that's not a good one to give you. Let me just do, let me think of one other here. Um, I'll use the trick function just to, all right, so what's y prime equal to? 
All right. So that is the sine of x times 3x minus Hold on. 3x squared. Yes, 3x squared. Yeah. Minus the cosine of x times x cubed all over sine squared x. Yeah, and notice this always comes into play where when we write it the way we memorize it, they're out of order. So I'm going to put this 3x squared in front of the sine x, and I'm going to put this x cubed in front of the cosine x. Notice uh, we can simplify this a little bit. Kind of factor out. We don't really know whether it'll be useful yet. We can factor out an x squared. Leaving. Leaving 3x sine three. x. No, just 3 sine x. 3 sine x. The, yeah, the x is with the cosine. That's what I was thinking. So what's the minus square? x cosine x? There you go. Yes. And like I said, I, you never know whether it's going to be useful to simplify it or not. If I had some number of x to an exponent in the bottom, it would be very useful. In this particular case, it doesn't really allow me to do anything more. Yes, sir. In other words, this answer here is just as good as my final answer. The only yes. time factoring helps, really, is if you can continue to simplify it. And that is frequently the case when you're using the quotient rule. I just can't think of an example where it is the case. I'm sure if I looked in the book, I could find lots of problems. But uh, I, I think you can see that it's, it's algebra is the real problem here. It's not calculus. Yes, sir. Let's talk about the last rule, the chain rule. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm going to teach you the easy way, and then I'll show you the hard explanation. Um, first of all, how do I rewrite this? Remember, the one thing you don't want in calculus is radical signs. So, we just, are we just going to square both sides? Can we do that? No, no we don't want to do that. We want to write it in exponential format. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Now, once you've written it in exponential format, see, this is a composite function. Yes, sir. It's a combination of uh, f of x being equal to x squared plus 1, g of x being square root of x. So if I were to say g of f of x, I would get the square root of x squared plus 1. That's yes, sir. a composite function. Whenever you have a composite function, you have to apply the chain rule. And simplistically, the chain rule is the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. So take the derivative of the outside. Okay, so... Just a plus X. So that would be... Always start with X times the coefficient. So it's going to be... One half x squared. Is that just one half x squared plus one? Yeah, it's always whatever is in the outside. To the what? Is, to the negative one half power? Yeah. 
Now you have to multiply that by the derivative of the inside. Okay. So the derivative of the inside, is that just um, 2x? Perfect. Okay. What that, I can rewrite that. I don't have to rewrite that. That's a perfectly acceptable answer. But if I wanted to rewrite it, my 2x is in the numerator. This is in the denominator. Yes. There's your derivative. Okay. See why it goes to uh, the denominator? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> now, <coughs> why do I put it back in radical format? Usually, the at least my understanding is that the general rule is if they give it to you in radical format and you can put it back in radical format, you should do so. I don't have to write it exactly like I have at the lower right. This is an acceptable answer right there. Although another general rule is you don't use negative exponents. So another better, maybe acceptable answer would be this. Ooh, the twos cancel. I hadn't seen that, but that's good to know because that's definitely a simplification. So this could be over this. So that's another answer. It's the same thing. Yes, sir. Okay. So um, just remember the chain rule applies whenever you have a composite function. Okay. Now, why is that? Let's see. If I say y equals, uh, let me think for a second. Hmm, hold on a second. Eh, let me. Let me start with something else. If I say y equals u, okay. say what is dy dx? Well, I don't have a function of x, at least not yet. I have a function that's in u. Okay. So what that's actually equal to is dy du times what? times d u d x excuse me d -U -D -Y. Oh, oh. sorry no it's d u d x i had it right the first time you can treat differentials much like you treat fractions okay if i simplify that what do i get i get d y d x right that's right. So when you are asked to do a derivative of a function that is not in the function's variable like this, they didn't ask me for what dy du was. They asked me for dy dx. Well, yes. it's dy du times du dx. Yes. That's obvious right there. And how does that play out? Well, there's the derivative of the outside. There is the derivative of the inside. So in the problem that I had before, I had square root of x squared plus 1, right? That was what u was. Okay. Okay. So when I tried to figure out what dy dx is, well, what's dy du? That is. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I have made a mistake here. Um, hmm, now let's change this to this. Now I think it's more understandable. 
Um, okay. Start with DYDU. So. Put in you. What's DYDU? DYDU. That is. Is that just? To you. To you. Mm -hmm. In other words, if the only thing. Uh, Okay. Do you? The only thing you have to apply is the power rule. That's right. But I know this is a composite function. So I, in order to find dy dx, I have to find dy du and multiply it by du dx. Well, in this case, u is this. Oh, hold on. Uh, hmm. I've messed this up, and I'm not I'm I'm not sure how, but I've I've messed it up, and it's not that important. The only reason I was explaining this is to explain why the chain rule is the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. That yes. is the derivative of the outside. That is the derivative of the inside. All right. Let's use another example that I don't confuse myself on. That is also a composite function. Okay. What's the derivative of the outside? That is, so 3x, is that the same as? Let, that, let, let 3x be u. What's the derivative of the outside? The derivative of the, okay, so that is the cosine. Okay, cosine of 3x. Now, times the derivative of the inside. There's your inside. Oh, okay. That makes sense now. Okay, so that is just 3. So the answer is 3 cosine of 3x. Yes, sir. Okay. Basically, you can think of this as being like that. Yes, sir. So I really had y equals the sine of u, and the derivative of the sine of u is the cosine of u times du dx. Well, du dx is 3. Yes, sir. So the key to the chain rule is figuring out what is the inside. Mm hmm I see. In a lot of cases, the inside is uh, pretty clear. What's the inside? X cubed minus 1. So what's the derivative of this guy? So that's going to be 2 times... I'll always start there. In other words, you're taking, you're starting with the derivative of the outside, right? That's right. So you're going to apply the power rule. Oh, okay. So that's three times x cubed minus one squared. Correct. Times the derivative of the inside. So that is two, three x squared. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Now. Obviously, I could have done this a different way. I could have expanded that so that I had one big long polynomial that had like four terms in it. As long as each of those terms is being added or subtracted, then I can differentiate each term alone. Yes, sir. But the chain rule makes it a lot easier, especially if this number is like a seven. <laughs> Now, expanding it would be a, a arduous task, whereas if I apply the chain rule, it's easy. 
Take the derivative yes, of the outside using the power rule times the derivative of the inside. So it's yes, seven to the sixth. Inside derivative doesn't change it. Now, the chain rule can be applied multiple times. Um, well, before we get to that, just like derivatives can be applied multiple times, you can have first derivative, second derivative, third derivative. What is the second derivative? It's the change of the change. In other so words, the first the derivative. derivative is the change in the function at a point in time. The second okay. derivative is the change of the change. In other words, let's just briefly talk about this. Okay. Second derivative is merely the derivative of the first derivative. That's all it is. Third derivative is the derivative of the second derivative. Fourth derivative, so forth and so on. Okay. Now, one of the things in physics is the position function. Okay, the position function. I'm trying to figure out how to explain this. That's equal to the velocity function. Second derivative is equal to the acceleration function. And if you think about this, let's take a particle moving along the x-axis. Okay? It's there. It has some speed going back and forth. Well, the first derivative of position is velocity. That's right. Second derivative of position is acceleration. Oh, that makes sense. So acceleration is the first derivative of velocity. And there's actually a third derivative called jerk. 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 I don't even know what letters are used to represent that, but you can kind of think of it as... Okay, that means where you're positioned when you're standing still. This means where you're positioned, what your velocity is at some point in time. This is what your acceleration is at some point in time. And if you think about smooth acceleration as opposed to the way my mother used to drive, <laughs> my mother used to drive with her foot both hands on the top of the steering wheel or foot on the accelerator and you go down the road jerking. Ugh. In other words, she would accelerate, put the brake on. Accelerate, put the brake on. That's what jerk is. It's the change in acceleration. Each one of these is the change in the one previous to it. And you can have derivatives all the way up to 100th derivative. There's no limit on derivatives. Now, wow. there is one rule about derivatives. Function has to be continuous in order to be differentiable at that point. In other words, if I had this function here, that function is not differentiable at 5 because it's not continuous there. Notice the slope of that tangent line is not necessarily the slope of that tangent line. Yes, sir. So it would have no meaning to say what's the derivative at that point because there's two different slopes. That makes sense. And hold on a second. I had a thought in my head and it just went away. Oh, yeah. Uh, the other type it's not just about continuity. It's about also there's a function that's continuous. 
Okay. What is that? The absolute value of X minus three. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. That is continuous throughout the domain from negative infinity to infinity, but it is not differentiable right there. Whenever you have a corner or a cusp, it's not differentiable at that point. I would not know no. how to draw that tangent line. You might say, well, it's pretty obvious that it's like that, but it's not really. It could be like this, it could be like that. There's no way when you have a corner or a cusp in your function that you can differentiate it at that point. Notice the slopes going in are all negative. The slopes coming out are all positive. So if you were to use the limit function, you would find two different limits at three, and the limits would not be defined at three. If the limit is not defined at x equal 3, then it is not differentiable there. Yes, sir. And that's probably all you need to know about that also. But this can apply in a lot of situations. Uh, it doesn't have to be a V. It can be something like that. That is a corner. Mm -hmm. OK. This function might be. Um, I might describe this function as being f of x equals x cubed when x is less than 3, and f of x is equal to 4 when x is greater than or equal to 3. So I can define the function. It's a piecewise function. And it's not differentiable at that corner. And you can kind of see why. The slope, when we look at it from the right, is 0. The slope, when we look at it from the left, is somewhere like that. That's certainly not mm. 0. So if you have slopes that are different, on the left and the right side of the corner, that's how you mathematically define whether you have a corner or a cusp. Oh, okay. Is the slopes approaching from the left? If they are the same as the slopes approaching from the right, then it's not a cusp or a corner. If they are different, it is a cusp or a corner. Okay. Okay, and that's really the way to define it. All right, uh, I've gone over a few minutes here. I didn't want to necessarily do that, but um, okay, that, that's a lot to absorb in one session. We did power rule, product rule, quotient rule, and chain rule, and we need to talk about the chain rule more because that can be two or three times the chain rule can be. It's not always just, sometimes it's the, outs, the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside times the derivative of the other inside. In other words, you'll have oh. multiple insides. But the chain rule is probably the most important of those, understanding it. And it's a it's the more difficult one. The others are just memorized. The product rule and the quotient rule, you just have to memorize it and be good at algebra. But the chain rule requires a little bit more. So next time we'll pick up at the chain rule. Yes, sir. Okay? All right. All right, Garrison. Um, I'll talk to you next Tuesday. Have a good week. You too. Bye-bye.